Hello everyone, this is Ian Ormus with Tech Defense again, and today uh, we're going to continue on with basic dynamic malware analysis in Tech Tip Episode 2. In this episode, we're going to do a Q&A from last week, go over an overview of what we'll hit up this week, and then we'll get right into the demo. So last week I received a few questions uh, from you guys out there. Uh, the one I got most often was, you know, where can I get some malware? I want to do some testing, but I, I don't know where to get malware to do that testing with. Uh, there's various places you can grab it. Um, of course, you could just go right into your spam folder in, in Gmail or, or Yahoo Mail, whatever you're using. And uh, a lot of those spam messages are going to link directly to malware. So if you just look at where those links are actually going, uh, some of them might be linking directly to an EXE. That is, uh, that is malicious. Of course, you have the uh, various online submission sites for malware, like uh, Threat Expert, uh, Anubis, MalWR. Some of those guys uh, publish reports on what they're finding as well. So if you just did a quick Google search on Threat Expert and .exe and look for the past week, you're going to see a bunch of links in there that will go directly to um, some malware that you can download and then start analyzing. While honeypots aren't necessarily a, a great defensive mechanism anymore, um, they are great for grabbing malware. So you can set up a honeypot uh, to grab some malware as well. And additionally, uh, you have the, the community at large. So if you uh, look around at some of the communities they have out there for malware analysis and get in with a good bunch of people, uh, usually you're, you're sharing malware amongst the group so you can all analyze it. The next question we're going to go over was, um, you know, do you have to start Netcat after each request? And the answer there is uh, simply no. Uh, that's just the, the way I type the command in. So if you did a, a NC TAC capital L TAC P80, that would continuously listen on port 80. Um, so it's, you know, the lowercase versus the uppercase L that makes the distinction there. Uh, additionally, though, you don't even really have to use Netcat. I was just showing you kind of a manual way to go about that process because, again, we really want to build up those fun fundamentals. Um, but you could have used another tool like iNetSim or actually we're going to go over one today called FakeNet um, that, that can emulate these services a lot better than you can with you know, Netcat by itself. And the last question we got was, you know, do we have to do this all manually every time um, or is there a better way to go about this a more efficient way? And the answer, of course, is you know, no, we don't have to do this manually every time. And, and again, I, I just think it's very important that people understand these manual processes before we start automating things. Um, you know, if you just went to Threat Expert, submitted your malware, and got a report back showing these indicators, uh, I don't think you really understand, you know, everything that goes into generating that report. Um, so that's why we go over these manual process, processes. But there's you know, various other applications that you can use for automation. Uh, you, of course, use the free ones, Anubis, Threat Expert, um, but there's other ones out there uh, that you can build out in your, your own lab. Uh, one I'll be doing over the next couple of weeks is uh, Cuckoo, getting that set up with VirtualBox. Um, so hopefully you'll get to see that in a future episode. Um, but additionally, you can just script it all out uh, manually. You don't have to even use one of these prepackaged solutions. Today we're going to take a look at FakeNet. Uh, FakeNet is a free tool to help out with malware analysis. Uh, what it's really doing is it's doing some of that netcat and a pate DNS like functions, uh, but adding a little bit more to it. So rather than just say listening on port 80, I'm now actually going to respond with whatever that malware was requesting. If it was requesting a JPEG, if it was requesting uh, in a static HTML file, I'm going to reply back with you know a fake entry for that to trick the malware into hopefully sending us more data without having to actually connect it to the internet. The guys over at practicalmalwareanalysis.com are the ones who created this uh, project. But in addition to that, they also published a great book recently called Practical Malware Analysis. So uh, if you want to learn more about you know, what we're talking about here, I uh, want to go further into it. That is a great resource. So definitely recommend you buy it. Go to their site if you want to. All right, so let's get into the demo and show you what I'm talking about. All right, everybody, time for the demo. Um, so... Last week we talked about how to use all of these programs you see here on the side uh, to take a look at malware and, and, and grab some indicators from it to find out what it's doing. 
again, we're still sticking with basic dynamic analysis. We're not going to get into the static side of things yet. And of course, we're not going to get into the advanced side either. Uh, but what I want to talk to you today is about fake net and how we can use that to kind of get rid of some of these things that we were running before and also pro provide a little more value. So like I was talking about before, fake net is a tool that's going to uh, do what it sounds like it's going to do. It's going to fake uh, some network services uh, while also grabbing some data for us. So just to show you what it looks like when you download it have it in my tools and I believe right here yes fake net okay so fake net we run it just by simply uh, running this executable here the fake net.exe executable but before we do that let's take a look at the config so the config here allows us to pretty easily set this up the way we want uh, the notes of course tell you a little bit about the config and and how you can uh, change it to fit your needs but the one things I'll, I'll recommend doing is a packet dump. I don't think that's enabled by uh, default, so I would select yes to that, and that is going to take a PCAP of all the traffic on this machine, which is great, um, so you don't have to run Wireshark on, on its own, and I believe this is probably just running T-Shark or something in the background. DNS options, modifying local DNS. So what this option does is we're, we're saying modify our local DNS to be whatever the DNS uh, server we want it to be is. And in this case, we're going to say localhost. So again, we'll be using that 127.0.0.1. If, for instance, we have this machine set up, um, or if we had a, another machine that was going to be our infected machine, and we wanted it to send its information to a different machine on our network where we have fake net running, then we would want to take that option off and uh, not replace our local DNS because we'd be replacing it on the infected machine. Um, so enable dummy service. Uh, what this is going to do, and, and you'll actually see this in a second when I show you, but it, it's talking about what these listeners are going to re reply back with. And uh, output options, you're going to want to say yes to this as well. I don't think that's by default either. And uh, what it's going to do is just going to create a little log for you at the end showing everything that's occurred. Um, so by default, these are the listeners that are set up down here. So you see this one for DNS, HTTP, HTTPS, and of course, uh, some non-standard HTTP ports. Additionally, they have uh, 1337 or Elite and 31337 through 37 Elite set up here as well. We could just as easily add anything we wanted here, uh, and to do that, we simply, whichever listener we want to use, set it up and put the port number that we want to uh, use for that. So that's uh, the extent of this. I didn't mention it does have the ability to look at any outgoing SMTP as well, so if the malware tries to uh, execute some SMTP stuff, we're going to see that as well. So let's exit out of the config, and first things first, we'll start up FakeNet. So as you can see, it's setting up the listener on each of those ports. And now, when anybody tries to connect to any of these ports, it's going to create an entry here. In addition to the entry that it creates here, it's also going to add it to the output files that we've specified. So you'll see Wireshark here, and uh, over here we have uh, just the log file portion. Now before running any of this, I'm going to go ahead and set up my uh, VM to use uh, host-only mode for the NIC. So by default, your VMs are set up to use NAT. So go ahead and switch that to host-only. And then what that does is makes it so uh, it can only talk to machines within your uh, private network. It's not going to go outside towards the internet. So I set that up and you'll see my network cable comes unplugged and it should be pulling an IP in a second, which it is now. So FakeNet takes care of a lot of the tools for us. We don't have to run Netcat anymore. We don't have to run Wireshark anymore. And of course, we also don't have to 
um, run a paid DNS anymore because we're doing that all with with fake net. Okay, so now we're going to uh, start up our tools just like we did last time. So I'm going to start up Process Hacker. Uh, I think last time we used Process Explorer, but this time we'll use Process Hacker. It's uh, pretty much the same thing, except it gives you a few extra little features, which you can tell from the different options we have available up here. Uh, plus it'll alert you if there's a new service created, which is nice. Um, we'll also want to get Process Monitor up. So let's go to our Tools folder. And it's just internal. And let's get process mod. Okay. Uh, for this one, what we're going to do is set it up to look for this exe here. So set up our filter. I wanted to show in the window uh, anything that matches this process name. Additionally, I want to know a couple of other things. So I want to know when the operation is create file, and I want to know when the operation is write file. Now the good thing is this is capturing everything. Um, so when you set up your filter, it's still, you see everything capturing down here, the 103, 104 now. Um, it's still capturing everything. So if you want to add another filter later, it's not like you have to restart your capture. It's all there. You're just choosing which ones are going to show up here in the beginning. So that's taken care of, uh, again, all the stuff that we get with FakeNet. We get Process Spore and Process Mon now done. Um, and the last thing we're going to do is red shot. So let's go back over here, grab red shot, and run. So again we're going to do the first shot just like we did last time. And then after with the malware run for a couple seconds uh, or a minute or so, we'll do a second shot that we can then compare it to. And it's good. So let's throw that to the side. Process monitor up there. Process hacker running. And of course we want to see here. Now you can see we fake the or fake nets already caught a few things. Um, these aren't malicious things, but for instance, process hacker, which we're running over here, right? Uh, when that is opened up, it tries to contact home to look for updates. So that's what we see there. And of course, you get those point records for the addresses that we tried to resolve. Okay, so now let's run our sample. Go to the samples directory. There, dir, and that's the one we're going to run. Let's give it a second to go. You can see, again, just like last time, and we're looking at a very similar uh, malware variant that we looked at last time as well. So we can see everything that it's trying to do, that particular EXE. Let's go down farther and hopefully we'll see. Hopefully we'll see some stuff that's not it, but not yet. In addition, what you should also see is over here on FakeNet. So it's trying to do some UDP on some weird ports that we don't necessarily um, look out for normally. 
And of course everything is grabbing here, it's also dumping to that log file. Well, let's watch it for a little bit still, because I would expect at some point this malware is going to, uh, you know, trying to resolve an outside host and then try to hit it on some of our normal traffic that we would expect to see, AD and 443. Okay, so now we can see it's doing what we expect it to do. Uh, we can see, again, what uh, URL it's trying to get to, what port it's trying to get to. If it has a unique user agent, we're going to see that. We'll also see any post and gets that it attempts to do uh, for any specific stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and close out fake net now. Let's go to red shot, get our second shot. and hit compare. So now again we can see what it was trying to do. Now some of the stuff obviously again is uh, because of the tools that we we're running so you just have to keep an eye on that type of stuff and be able to recognize it. But in addition to that we're going to see plenty of other stuff in relation to uh, this particular malware. So. Again, we'll see the same stuff that we saw last time. Okay. So, but let's take a look at what we can see just by using, you know, FakeNet, right? So if we go back to FakeNet itself, and we have our two folders, right? We have our uh, Wireshark outputs, and of course we also have our outputs from the actual uh, event. So let's look at the bigger of the two for each because that's the most recent one. And we'll look at the output first. So uh, here we see what we're listening on. And we see that first thing we saw that we expected to, right? The process hacker. Then we see that weird UDP stuff that we'll have to take a look at. But after we get through that, we start seeing some hmm, can we get to Google? And then Bing. And then it starts with its uh, randomized URLs. But what's going on here, right, is you know, this is very common that we'll, we'll see this quite often in malware, is it's looking for Google, it's looking for Bing to ensure that it can actually uh, get to a legitimate website. So that way it knows that it's in a place where it has an internet connection. If it's able to get there, then it thinks it can continue on. And the reason it thinks it can continue on is because FakeNet replied back. So it always is always going to reply back when these you know attempt, attempt to connect on port 80. FakeNet's going to reply back with a 200 status each time, which is um, you know a secede. It, it's actually made it made it through. Um, so according to you know, the malware, if it's just looking for a 200, then it's going to go through. But in addition, FakeNet does something that's uh, a little different as well. So if it sees uh, a GET request, it's going to serve up one of these following uh, files based on what the GET request was for. So if it's looking for an EXE, it's going to run this EXE. If it's looking for a PNG, a JPEG, um, or just a, a, an HTML page, it's going to get one of these files. So that even you know takes it a step further. So not only are we just listening on that port, uh, but now we're replying back with content with uh, which could be you know then at least from the malware's point of view considered to be legitimate. So if the malware thinks that it's legitimate, it's going to continue on running what it thinks it should run. So at this case, now it just wants to download more malware. And it wants to go to all these websites, all these domains, until it gets to the point where it can actually connect to one and download the specific malware that it wants. Now unfortunately, we'd have to delve further into 
uh, the malware itself to find out, you know, what's the name it's looking for? Is it looking for a specific name? Is it looking for a particular string? Um, is it looking for uh, something on that website uh, before it is able to launch um, the additional downloads? So we don't know that information yet because we haven't delved further into uh, the static side um, or run it through a debugger yet. So we don't really know what it's looking for. We're just kind of looking at it, what it does, based on the behaviors that we see. And that's what we're seeing here. So in addition to getting this, FakeNet also gives us a PCAP. Now the PCAP's not terribly helpful because you're getting so much information out of this output file, you don't really even need uh, the PCAP. But the PCAP can show us very similar information. Here comes Wireshark. So here is uh, you know all that weird UDP stuff that we were seeing before, and I'd really have to look at this one to find out what's going on there. But one of the things that you you got to remember in in Wireshark is it does let you get a little bit more information uh, in the sense that you can kind of follow the stream and, and find out what's going on. So for instance, if this UDP one here, if we want to find out, you know, did it get a reply um, and what the reply said, we click follow UDP stream and it would show, you know, both the content from the source and the destination. Now, of course, in our scenario, uh, it doesn't work that way because we didn't have anything particularly listening on that port. So let's go clear that filter. But when you get down to here, um, let's see. Let's go to the Bing one. So we see uh, the DNS request for Bing, and we see us reply back saying, uh, yes, Bing is 127.00.1. Now we see that TCP handshake, and then the Git request for that. So let's see what this looks like in the TCP stream. So we see that Git request. And in this case, we see our reply, our 200 OK, but we also see uh, everything else that is, is in that static HTML file. Now, that HTML file is actually just a help file for the product, uh, fake net. But we could make it say whatever we wanted or have it run any particular thing we needed it to run. Uh, additionally, we could fire up you know, the burp suite or, or a tool you know, like that where we can look at what it's trying to do and then kind of uh, mess with it in, in transit to get the results that we need out of the product. Of course, you can do all your normal stuff. Uh, why does my DNS filter not work? Ah, oh, there we go. So um, if we just want to see everything that it tried to um, you know, resolve, we can type DNS in as our filter hit enter. Now it's going to show us all the uh, request and response that occurred. Now these all look randomized and if we went and, and tried to see if these are registered to anybody I'm, I'm sure they're probably not at least not yet um, but you know some number of these will be and once it finds the one that it, it needs to that's when it's going to download the rest of the information that it it needs to grab. So that uh, you know covers what I wanted to talk about with FakeNet. And next time we'll, we'll do a little bit of static analysis um, and then put it all together so we can find out you know, what is this malware actually doing. So I hope you enjoyed. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining me for uh, episode two of Tech Tip. Uh, this, of course, is brought to you by Tech Defense. Tech Defense has plenty of other articles uh, and tech tips as well, so go and check that out. Additionally, today we'll be uh, posting our first threat down uh, video format anyways, uh, where we go over some of the uh, latest in IT security news. Um, check out securitytube.net as well. That's where uh, a, a lot of viewers are, are coming from. So uh, it's a great collaboration portal for um, all sorts of IT security videos. Additionally, they have some kind of uh, certification track, uh, but I'm not too familiar with that at this point. And last but not least, 
Um, practical malware analysis, we talked about earlier. Uh, go to practical, practicalmalwareanalysis.com if you want to grab that book. Uh, it's definitely worth it. Thank you.